engineer. I was dead set on that. Took one mechanical engineering class, fell in love with it, never turned back. Um, took a uh, major than Mechie with minors in robotics and computer science at CMU, um, which now has a robotics double major, fun fact. Um, loved it there. Decided to go to grad school. My dream had always been to build robots for NASA. I wanted to build rovers. Um, so I was going to go get my master's degree so that I could go work for NASA. I interned for NASA summer after my senior year. Loved it. Did some rover work there. Went to Berkeley for my master's. I was intended to just do a master's year, maybe two, get out, go work. It's a great idea in theory. Then I went to find an advisor. Found my advisor, Professor Casabruni, and he was like, hey, Katie, so we're going to start working on this exoskeleton project for people who have had a stroke. Are you interested? It's like, well, funny you should ask. That sounds awesome. My grandmother had had a stroke in 1992, and she lives in Pittsburgh. So while I was in college, I actually lived with her for a summer. And I saw how difficult the effects of the stroke had been on her, and how much more rehab she could have benefited from, etc. And I was like, robots to make this better sounds like a perfect match. And I'd always actually kind of liked working with people, which some engineers don't. So it sounded like a great mix. So I started in Professor Pazzarini's lab. It's the Human Engineering Lab, also known as HELL. Um, he's really bad at making acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> His previous lab before that, we don't know what it actually was, but the acronym for the lab was BAD. So all of our tools were labeled BAD, which is really hard to figure out. You go into the lab and you pick up a hammer, and you're like, guys, how is this BAD? <laughs> But anyway, so I worked in Hell um, and fell in love with the project. I ended up working on uh, exoskeletons to help we work some with stroke patients and some with spinal cord injury patients, and I just I fell in love with it. And I started working with a company that Kaz had founded and did my graduate work with them, and so it came time to, for me to get my master's and leave. And I got my master's and didn't leave. Um, decided that I wanted to stay on, keep working on the project, and take it as far as I could. So I stayed for my PhD. Um, I graduated last December from Berkeley, um, PhD in mechanical engineering with a focus in control systems. Um, you don't know what control system is, don't worry. Run if someone offers you to major in control systems. It's like the most software mathematical <coughs> form of mechanical engineering you could ask for, but it's actually a lot of fun. So that's my focus. So after I graduated, I continued working at my advisor's company, which was renamed from Berkeley Bionics to Exobionics, E-K-S-O, not E-X-O, um, where I'm, my title is actually software engineer, uh, because I have degrees in mechanical engineering, so clearly I should be a software engineer. <laughs> and, um, but I write control system software for the exoskeleton, um, which I'll show you a video of in a minute. But does anyone have any questions or want me to expand on any of the bio before I go into the robot? <laughs> Dead silence. Okay, I'll talk about the robot because that's cooler. Anyway. Um, so let me see if I can find it. Sure. Which I'm sure I can. Um, maybe. So anyway, exoskeletons are wearable robots. So anyone seen Iron Man? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have no jetpacks, but it's kind of like that, um, except that it doesn't like clamp quite as excitingly around you. That's really exciting, but um, it's kind of like Iron Man. You wear the exoskeleton. So we originally started making these for soldiers because um, military money is a lot easier to come by than healthcare money. Um, go America. Uh, so, so we originally made this for strength augmentation. So we have a robot called Hulk. HULC stands for Human Universal Load Carrier, because as you know, every roboticist names their thing some acronym of some sort, so ours is Hulk. Um, Hulk is a wearable exoskeleton, it's hydraulic, um, and it's meant to support the weight of the robot as well as the weight of whatever pack you're wearing on your front or your back, um, so it carries like your armor, uh, you know, extra bullets or food or water, whatever you want. So it's actually a pretty sweet system. I can carry my body weight on my back without any problem. You feel the inertia.
inertial effects, but not the weight. So it's, it's really cool. We're hoping that it helps to kind of reduce injuries and increase the fatigue, you know, decrease fatigue of the soldiers. You've probably seen Boston Dynamics Big Dog. Anyone? Yeah, one. Okay. If you haven't looked for it, it's kind of cool. But it's this like big dog looking robot that like is supposed to carry all the gear. And this is supposed to also kind of do what we're doing, allow the soldiers to carry more and go farther. The problem with that is you separate the person from their gear, which is usually not real good in war situations. So that's also you can hear it coming from like a mile away. So the thing runs on like a lawnmower engine or something. So, um, so we decided we've got to keep the gear on the person. We've just got to make it easier for them to walk with it. So we developed this hull. Um, Lockheed Martin now licenses Hulk. Um, Raytheon has an equivalent suit called Sar uh, Sarcos. I forget what it's called. Sarcos makes it. Sarcos, Raytheon, search it, you'll find it. Um, so, of course, Raytheon had one, so Lockheed also needed one, so they bought ours, which is kind of cool. So, we have a partnership now with Lockheed Martin working on military applications for the XM. But we also wanted to work on medical. Um, and spinal cord injury, this isn't loading, but there's a really cool robot somewhere. Uh, so, I'll show you videos. Uh, spinal cord injury is kind of the first market we went into. So, everyone know what a paraplegic is? No. Okay. Anyone not? Okay. Spinal cord injury. Uh, para, so the injuries are labeled by where on the spine you've been hurt. Um, you've got your, your lumbar. Um, there's another, so, yeah, lumbar, thoracic, T, and then cervical up on top. Um, cervical range injuries are quad most of the time, quadriplegics. Um, we've worked with some lower quads, but mostly we work with paras because we use the arms a lot for stability and strength. So, if this video ever comes, there's uh, a lot of our test pilots, and we work with anyone from Basically a C1 down to, well, all the way down, but it's really less useful for the L style injuries. So what this means is the robot has to not only move the person's legs, but also kind of support their torso. If you have an L1 in, or a T11, T12 injury, which is pretty common from car crashes because you kind of get thrown forward like that and you get an injury at your the, um, T11, T12. Um, you have a little bit of ab control, but not necessarily a ton. So not only do you not have your legs moving, but your abs aren't working real well either. As you get higher, this becomes more and more of a problem. So I don't know how much you realize you use your abs, but it's a lot. So we have to support the person in all of that um, in the robot. And so that leads to a lot of challenges that are really actually pretty interesting to think about. Um, the Robot has to hold the person up while they basically have like useless legs below them. Um, we've got to protect their skin. Pressure sores are a huge problem for people with spinal cord injury. You've got limited circulation. You can't really feel when you get like rubbing and stuff like that. So we had to think about that. Um, basically, we have a ton of design challenges that we have to take into consideration when we're building a robot like this, and so. Um, I can talk about some of them as we watch the video, but the main thing that my research was on was the human-machine interface, and I'm going to show you the video that mostly focuses on the human-machine interface because that was kind of our new release um, this month or last month, so that's what we're kind of talking, or what our new like press releases are on. But basically, when the military XO wants to walk, when you want to move forward, you say, okay, I'm going to move forward, I'm going to lift up my leg, it's going to help me, it's going to support the weight, help me move, but I'm starting the motion. That's great, that's really easy to work with, it's really intuitive to teach people how to do that, but it turns out when you're paralyzed, that's kind of impossible. So we had to come up with a different way, and you don't want to have to like push a button every time you want to take a step, or say, step, and the robot responds, or something like that, that's really obnoxious. If you're going to go out into the community, like, imagine your classmate walking down the hall going, step, step. Like, not cool, right? So, I mean, they're wearing a robot, which is kind of cool. But besides that, um, 
less cold. So what I focused on and what my research was on was the human-machine interface. How does the person tell the exoskeleton what to do? So for this, you need one exoskeleton, so we had to help build that. You need sensors. you got to figure out what do you want to sense, what, what can the person do, and how are we going to translate that into a step. Then you need software, clearly, it translates the step into the motion, whatever, the sensor information. And then you need to test it a lot. So we have lots of people who come in to test it for us. So I'll show you a video of it in action, maybe. Because an error occurred. Anyone have any questions so I can try to load this? Awesome. This is worth it. What areas is it pneumatic in? Oh, okay. Good question. So we actually switched from a hydraulic system to an electromechanical system when we switched to the military, or from military to um, the medical. This was a really tough decision. Um, so hydraulics have the benefit of you can put your motors anywhere, your motors and your pumps anywhere, and then just run hoses and things work awesomely really cool. Um, we actually, as a company, we've developed some of our own. Uh, there's, yeah, there's the one that's called, like, August 2012 new, um, August 2012 upgrade. So, um, oh, now it's going to like, really cool. Um, so, okay, so what, we were deciding this and like hydraulics definitely have their advantage. We've developed some new valves that like are really efficient and high pressure so we can run like really fast. Um, that was a great idea, but hydraulics also leak. Um, and when you run them at higher pressures, they leak more. And so that's fine for the military when you can have, you can expect them to do maintenance on it. In the hospitals, you can't expect them to do maintenance. So we went to a, a mechanical actuator. It's a motor drive with direct drive ball screw, so um, it's now all electromechanical. So it's got four motors, four degrees of freedom, hips and knees, sagittal plane only, so it's theoretically as simple as it gets. It's really cursed. Anyone else have any other questions while we stall for a video? Really? <laughs> Someone make something up. But you know the answer to, yeah. So, um, so how did you make the uh, user most comfortable in the exoskeleton? Um, like physically or? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, a lot of trial and error. We, we messed up a few times. But if you think about like what's going to happen if you're kind of standing and they can't support yourself. So I'm falling here, I'm falling here, and I'm falling here. Turns out that's exactly what happened. So what we did was we put, our military exo had some straps here. So we already knew we could hold people up there. And we kind of thought, like in the military exo, that's enough. But you can also use your knees. So this was, we were like, okay, we've got straps here. It'll work. It doesn't work. <laughs> then we were like, um, okay, we need to kind of support back at the back a little bit. So we put a little shelf here. Still didn't work. And then we're like, you almost need something like, shin guards or something to hold their, their shins up. So we went to Academy, I bought some shin guards and pulled them onto the robot. <laughs> um, they were Puma brand, um, they had the Pumas on them. That, that solution actually worked fabulously. It was because it's exactly what you need. It's a pad right at the shin, it's formed to your shin. Um, that's a bony prominence if you aren't aware, it hurts if you rub there or anything, so we had to be really careful about what we put on the shin, uh, but shin guards turns out are really made for that, so we used a shin guard. Um, at some point when we started selling them, someone was like, we can't just buy Puma brand shin guards all the time from Academy, so we actually made our own, but it looks a lot like a shin guard. Um, then we still had to tackle this back issue. A lot of people with spinal cord injuries have rods in their back because you fuse things back together, put plates, hold everything in place. But a lot of times because of that, they kind of have an extended arch in the back. 
And so the butt kind of still wants to sneak out of the back of the robot. So we just put more padding and more of a plate back here to hold the back. Um, seems like a really simple solution. Somehow it worked. We're not really sure how. Um, but that kind of seems to hold everything where you want it to be with the minimal padding. It does get a little hot sometimes because you've got you know, a pretty thick pad here. A uh, good chunk of your shin is covered, but it seems to work. Um, the backpack, we all the computer and the batteries are on the backpack, and um, we use a design we basically copied off of backpacking backpacks for that. So there's a, a back brace um, torso pad that kind of works like a corset. Um, we have those in varying heights for the people with like a T11 injury who really have ab and core muscles. We just kind of use the short one and it just kind of keeps the robot there. For people who don't have core and their whole torso wants to arch forward, we have like taller ones that work for that. So. Sweet. You all take walking for granted. But there are so many people out there that simply don't have that option in their life. They only have the wheelchair. <laughs> There's been great advancements in wheelchairs. People live a very full life, but they can't walk. And that is what the bionic suit gives you. I always felt like there was no hope for me. Nine years ago, they told me I would never walk again, no matter what. Now when people tell me you can't do something, I'm like, oh, oh, yes, I can. I feel like there isn't anything out there that I can't do now. We have just introduced a brand new EXO. We're revealing a new step mode. And so there's three modes that we can actually work in. The first mode is first step. It actually allows the therapist to initiate the step so they can train the new user while they're in the machine to feel where that balance point is, and then when they feel that they're at the right spot, the, the physical therapist actually triggers the step. The next progression is to active step, where we actually give the user the ability to trigger the step with their own button push. And so the user, while walking either with crutches or with a walker, when they feel comfortable, they can actually trigger and take the next step. And then the final progression is what we call pro step. And with pro step, the device itself can actually sense just by the user's gesture and positioning when that user has gotten into the right position that knows they want to take a step and it actually takes the step for them. So it's very transparent for the user. It's amazing. It's freedom. I'm totally independent and I don't have to rely on anybody else pressing a button for me. In addition, we are introducing Axel Pulse. The Pulse is really a tool that will allow us to stream data from EXO, giving information about the body performance, both to the rehab centers as well as to the users. So we can actually use this data to both improve the user's outcome and improve our future products. We at EXO Bionics have introduced the first EXO that is intended for rehabilitation and gait therapy. Ready? Yeah. Step now. It's now available in some of the top rehab centers around the world. I think the ExoSuit is an exciting new piece of technology because it allows us as therapists to get individuals who have been badly injured, who have significant neurologic damage to their nervous system, and it allows us to get them up and on their feet so that they are weight-bearing and learning how to use that walking pattern again. So it really comes down to this partnership where clinicians and engineers need to work together so that we can advance technology and really make it usable and user-friendly for our individuals to be able to use in the community every single day. It feels unreal, you know, just to feel, I guess, how tall I actually am again. It's just weird to notice all the things that you notice at eye level when you're in a chair versus when you're upright. It's the little things that count. We are the first European center to work with the exoskeleton. Till now we treat a very uh, small number of patients, but in terms of neuropsychological aspects, autonomic aspects and neurological aspects, we have achieved very excellent results. Our patients are very impressed. 
the ambition is to give to the patients the opportunity to be and feel the freedom from their wheelchair in their own life. We have a lot of patients that spend their life on a wheelchair. We can have a lot of patients now spending their life on exoskeleton. For the first time in history, we are upgrading the body. Now, finally, there is a chance for people who suffer spinal cord injuries, stroke, cervical palsy, multiple sclerosis, to simply have a real option to stand up and walk. Our goal is to help people walk out of rehabilitation. Having the exosuit in my life has redefined what it means to be a paraplegic. In the future, people aren't going to view me as someone who is incapable of doing things. Exoskeletons are not science fiction anymore. They're here, they're a reality, and in fact, they're inevitable. You're just seeing the first model. So one of the things that I wanted to kind of leave you guys with as a thought is um, when Candy said that one of the really important things about you know, what we're doing is that the engineers are working with the clinicians. And I think sometimes we really get kind of into our own our own heads and our own like problems. And I know like with first the games are kind of I mean they're made up, right? Like I don't know I don't even know what the challenge is, but like when we were doing you know some of this stuff it was like you had to go through a spinny table and go through it. like no one really ever needs a robot that's gonna go through a spinny table, right? But you're gonna use a lot of the, the things that you've learned from doing these challenges in the real world. But it's really important to keep in mind what people actually need. And so the difference between you know engineering products that become products and go somewhere and the difference between those that just kind of like sit in the classroom are the ones that you kind of keep your end user in mind and actually work with them to make it you know the device that they need. So, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah. Can uh, they walk without the painted things? No. Um, so because we only actuate in the side of the plane. Um, there, we really don't have balance right now. And so they're using the crutches or the walker, depending on their skill, um, to kind of help with that sagittal plane balance and also to push themselves forward a little bit. Um, not very good at double stance, um, so pushing yourself over that front. But So they're using the crutch there a bit. We can probably take care of that, but the lateral balance is still kind of tricky. So um, it's the goal eventually, but not yet. Um, the, the machine is mechanically able to get up and down stairs, so the motors are powerful enough, everything else is strong enough. Um, we ran out of time, didn't finish the code, so it can't, but um, actually we were able to go up curbs as of Friday, so a single step. Um, so one of the other guys back at, in Berkeley is working on that. So inclines we should be able to do, stairs we should be able to do. Um, Mechanically, it's not hard. Actually, if you know where you're stepping, it's really not hard. The real problem is, is like, how do you know where the staircase starts? How tall is the step? How deep is the step? All of those things. Like, if you think about, you know, the stairwell, up, you know, out here is pretty standard, right? But like, the stairs up the front of the campus, they're kind of like wide and shallow. Those are different. So we don't really know how to do that yet. So if you guys want to figure that out? Let me know. Sweet. <laughs> Um, otherwise, we'll work on it. Yeah. Uh, what what materials are made out of? Um, like structurally. A, a lot. Um, a lot of aluminum. Uh, aluminum, lightweight, pretty strong. Um, where you need it. Steel pieces where we need the extra strength. We've got some carbon fiber, um, mostly in our covers and stuff like that, where we needed like really precise shapes that can be just kind of cut. We don't do a lot of carbon fiber fiber layups for stuff like three-dimensional parts. Um, we don't, I don't know why. There's a lot of plastic for covering stuff. Um, lots of pinch points apparently when you make robots, and when you put someone in them, that's bad, so we cover everything with plastic. Um, lots of different fabrics. Um, everything has to be wipeable for germ control and stuff, so that's all there. Um, 
feet have a vibram sole. I'd say mostly aluminum. Um, it's got pretty, you know, it's got good strength, a little bit of flexibility, not real um, light, cheap. So, uh, but yeah, it depends upon what part it is and where strength we need. Um, it seems that it has a pretty natural appearance um, when it takes a step. Was that y'all's intention from the very beginning, or did y'all work that in once you got the mechanics out? Um, so. Our intention has always been a natural gait. And uh, as a controls major, that was my only goal. Uh, because my my goal, and one of my fellow lab mates, who actually, his PhD was on the gait trajectory, um, we really wanted that to be good. If you look at our competitors, so who watches Glee? Anyone? Really? No one watches Glee? OK, we've got two. <laughs> who saw the Christmas episode where Arnie gets new legs? OK. So thanks. Good. Somebody is up with it. Okay. So when Arlie gets new legs, uh, those are actually legs from where you walk. Um, and that's our competitor. Basically, there's two of us out there doing this because like, the market is so big. Um, it actually is a pretty big market. It's actually kind of sad how big it is. But anyway, um, rewalk has kind of a not natural gait. And we knew that that's where we could define ourselves. And rewalk was always meant to be a mobility device, so get out into the community, walk around. We really wanted to make a rehab device, and if you're going to rehab and teach someone how to walk and how to walk well, it's got to look like walking. You can't do other things or just swing your hip through, you know, like that. So we spent a lot of time studying gait. Um, I learned more biomechanics than I ever thought I would. Read a lot of books on walking, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, and so we, we do do a lot. Um, a lot of people who do walking robots and walking machines and stuff, you take a trajectory for your knee and your hip angles, and you just play that trajectory, and you repeat it, and you kind of hope that that works. And so it works great when you play this trajectory, right? But as soon as the person's leaning too far forward on their crutch, you, you do this, yeah. and it doesn't work. Like, so you end up overcompensating for that by doing like these really high things or you swing the leg around or something like that. And it's, So basically people don't accommodate for what the person is doing in the machine. So we said we should, we should do that. <laughs> so we do. And so our trajectories are not pre-programmed just paths that we follow. We actually accommodate the person and work with them as they go. So it has resulted in a much more natural looking trajectory. It also results in much, much more complex code, which is much, much more prone to bugs. Um, because you can't just say, like, plot it and was it right? Because you have no idea because it's based on, like, 10 other variables. And so testing is fun. And, um, all kinds of stuff. It, it, it does add a lot of complexity. There's a lot of reason why people do what they do. But we think the result is worth it. We put a lot of time into it. Um, my lab mate got a PhD thesis out of it, and we're still working on it. So, um, so answer to your question is yes, that was always an intention. Um, and we put a lot into it to make it look that way. And now we're trying to get the robot to work even more with the person. So if they're an incomplete or a stroke patient or something, that they can actually influence it even more.
But you know, we're not in like mass production, and we're selling to hospitals who are these are very adjustable machines, usable for everyone. And so we're hoping to eventually in 2014, it's our goal, get a personal model that would be like the cost of a you know, expensive car or something, so that anyone can hopefully buy it. But they also want more features. They don't want the price to go up. <laughs>
I was always, we always did really well in the presentations. We like won presentation because that's, I don't know why, but we were good at it. And I think that was really good because I learned how to talk to people about engineering stuff. And I, one of my coworkers, he's a great guy, great guy, but like, he has really good ideas and people stop listening to him because he doesn't like finish the idea or get to the point. And I think it's really unfortunate because I think he's got like really cool stuff, um, but he doesn't necessarily have the best, best presentation skills. And I think that that's a really important skill that like regardless of whether you can like solve differential equations like in your sleep, you should be able to like present your ideas because then everyone can come up with like you know, really great ideas, really off, you know, just whatever. But if you can't sell it to your coworkers or your peers or your teammates, it doesn't really matter, you know? That's, that's kind of the tough part of it. Like, you have to sell your idea to someone. So learning to present is another good thing. Are there any seniors? Do anyone know where they're going to school? <laughs> <laughs> anyone want to go to CMU or Berkeley? Let me know. I can give you some tips. Um, yeah, that's it. Is everyone going to major in engineering? Or are you bailing as quickly as possible? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Don't know. So, there's a lot of engineering disciplines. I suggest checking them all out. Because um, you never know what you'll like. There's different subfields in all of them. Um, somehow, it's an intended electrical. I made it to mechanical and have ended up in software. So, the lines are really blurry these days, which is great. It allows you a lot more flexibility. You can really find something you like. So. Nothing else? Uh, all right. If you want to stick around for a bit, cool. they'll uh, get started on their actual projects. Sweet. Uh, and yeah. it's, they're normally more responsive in smaller groups. They, they, don't, <laughs> they don't ask me questions on groups. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've been trying to do it for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Mr. Burns could get us to stop talking long enough to do a presentation, so. No, you're right. Yeah, you're the third we've done like this. We had a guy from NASA's EV, uh, EVA team come. Oh, nice.